Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar, DBX 4K60, How to Configure Distance Learning Enabled Training Environments presented by Jeff Birch. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. Just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a Q&A function where you can submit your questions to the presenter and he'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. The webinar is being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop series that can be found on pro.harman.com. We're adding new sessions daily, and right now we have over 20 sessions scheduled for August and September, so watch for those on the calendar. And now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Jeff Birch, the presenter for today's webinar. Jeff serves as Director of Product Management for the Video and Control Group at Harman Professional Solutions. He is skilled in product portfolio management, data-driven innovation, agile product development, and customer-focused product marketing. Now I'll pass it over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Laura, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, today, we're going to explore the process of configuring a DVX, uh, and we're going to be highlighting many of the key features that really allow integrators to deliver perfect video and audio uh, to, the, uh, to the end user. So uh, we're gonna use as an example, uh, a distance learning enabled training environment. Um, but first, uh, for those of you who may not be uh, fully familiar with the DVX 4K, uh, we'll go through a quick overview. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, the design of the learning environment that we're going to, uh, that we're gonna configure a little bit later on. We'll talk about unboxing the DVX. We'll go into uh, a little bit of information about uh, the two models that we have, what features that they have and how they differ. Um, and at the end, we've budgeted some time to answer any questions that you may have. So feel free to type those into the chat as you go. So the DVX 4K uh, presentation switcher is a unified uh, audio video control device. It replaces a full rack full of gear um, and that gives you a solution that's less expensive, it's easier to install, and uh, overall it's more reliable. Uh, there are two models that we have, and aside from um, some minor differences in the number of audio and video inputs, both models share the same capabilities. So uh, let's take a quick look at those capabilities. The DVX 4K is the first all-in-one presentation switcher to support uh, the latest HDMI 2.0 2.0, HDCP 2.2, full 4K60, 444 video with HDR deep color support uh, on every video input and output. Both models also have DX Link inputs and outputs. Uh, they feature smart scale so that you can deliver the perfect video to every display to match uh, what it requires. Uh, the DX Link inputs and outputs transmit audio, video, USB 2.0. Uh, and power up to 100 meters over a single category cable. Um, the DVX also features some, uh, some of Harman's legendary audio technology. So um, from DriveCore, we have 120 watt per channel amplifier. Uh, in uh, each SKU, there is both the high impedance uh, 70 volt, 100 volt amplifier and a four ohm, eight ohm amplifier that's selectable and we'll see how to do that in a minute. There's a full set of uh, DSP features from BSS, including mixing and ducking and compression. Uh, there's feedback suppression from DBX. Uh, there's a number of analog microphone inputs and also to simplify audio expansion, there are eight input and eight output channels of Dante Audio. This is another first uh, for products of this kind. And finally, both models include a full NX integrated uh, Netlinx controller. Uh, they all include an isolated ICS LAN network port to provide uh, control capabilities. And it's got all the latest network security features that you'd expect. So in order to illustrate some of the key features, we're gonna walk through a, um, a, a particular design that I'll show here. And, and really the idea is to try to offer a variety of uh, configuration options to get really superior audio and video in most any classroom, conference room that you want to use. This example has a variety of different inputs and outputs. It's got a number of different mixes and EQs that we want to make for audio. So it's really a good, uh, kind of a good training exercise for us to use. 
Uh, the room is designed, um, the idea behind it is to support both fully on-site uh, or fully remote or even a hybrid mix of both on-site and uh, remote participants. So we've got a web conferencing PC here. We're delivering two, uh, two HDMI inputs uh, from this uh, conferencing uh, solution. We've got a document camera, a media player, we also have a remote laptop. This is connecting in over DX Link, so it connects, uh, say, at a table or a lectern through a DX Link transmitter into uh, the, the, the DX Link input of the DVX. For video outputs, we've got a video recorder, we've got a confidence monitor, uh, and then we have a main front display that the audience sees and a main rear display that uh, the, the presenter or the professor could view. Uh, so if they're on a conference call, for example, they can see their audience in front of them, but then they could also see, say, a grid view of, of the people that are connected online. We've got some audio ins and outs, analog audio ins and outs going back to the web conferencing PC. We've got amplified output going to uh, a set of speakers. We're using a, a ceiling microphone array through Dante, uh, and then we have some other networking pieces here. So, um, so our first step in configuring the DVX is going to be pulling it out of the box. Um, the DVX ships with uh, some, some feet, um, but it also ships with some rack mounting ear. So you can put this um, in a lectern on top of a credenza in a cabinet. You can also put the rack ears on and mount it uh, in a standard, a standard rack. Um, all of the models are two rack units high. Um, if you're familiar with the older models, they were three rack units high. So this two rack unit gives you an extra rack unit of space to add some other components or, or maybe just give you enough space to make things look a little bit neater, give you a little more ventilation. Um, so on the front of the DVX, as you see here, we have some LEDs for some status input. We've got a USB port here to connect to your PC. You can actually configure it over that port. There's also a USB port you can plug in a thumb drive. Um, and this, this port's let you um, configure. Uh, you can load code files. You can um, read log files. You can even update firmware here. So these are nice if you happen to be in a situation where, uh, for some reason, you're not connected to a network. In the middle here, we have an LCD display. And on the right, we have some buttons. These buttons let you navigate uh, some menus over here to see status, and, and you can actually set some of the configuration items from this front panel. So if we turn it around, this is a 3266. Um, we can see that we've got six analog uh, mic line inputs here, mono mic line inputs. We've got a couple of uh, balanced and unbalanced uh, analog audio inputs, two uh, balanced and unbalanced analog audio outputs. We've got uh, this is the amplifier output that I mentioned. So it's got the, the 4 ohm, 8 ohm output as well as the 70 volt, 100 volt all in the same box. And over here on the right, it's got a dedicated network for uh, Dante channels for audio. In the middle here are the control ports. You've got serial, two serial, two IR, two relay, two IO. Um, you also have a standard network connection for connecting into the infrastructure as well as the ICS LAN port that's great for connecting into a private network. Along the bottom, this is all the audio video or all the, the video pieces. So you've got four HDMI inputs on the 3266. You've got four DX link inputs. Each one of these uh, comes with this uh, USB connection for passing through USB 2.0. We have four total HDMI outputs for HDMI. And then two of these HDMI outputs are mirrored to a DX link output. And again, each of these DX link outputs has its own uh, USB 2.0 connection there. Um, whatever uh, video is routed to this output comes out both the HDMI output and the DX link output. The DX link outputs here use and inputs use a standard HD based T chipset. So had we wanted to connect, uh, say, a, a, an HD based T camera, we could have connected that into a DX link input instead. Um, also point out that these are all powered. Uh, so any DX link transmitters and receivers that you connect in um, will be powered. Um, so speaking of those, um, uh, well, first we'll look at the 2265. It's very similar, as you can see. Um, the only difference is we've removed a couple of DX link inputs, and we've moved uh, removed a couple of the uh, the video outputs. So there's two HDMI outputs, and one of those outputs is mirrored to a DX link. And so now we move on to the DX link transmitters and receivers. These are the new 4K6444. 
these, uh, these support HDMI 2.0. They're very similar to our, our previous models that we've had. Uh, the big difference is the support for HDMI 2.0, HDCP 2.2, full 4K 6444, just like the, uh, the HDMI inputs and outputs that we talked about before. And it also, they also support HD, uh, USB 2.0 pass-through and not just uh, the HID pass-through. So I've already made some of the connections so we can move, uh, we can move on to our, our configuration walkthrough. Now the configuration is gonna be done using a web interface, unlike uh, some other solutions where you've got to uh, find and install uh, an app of some sort, maybe you've got to get permission to install an app, then you have to keep it maintained as there are updates. With the DVX, you just point your web browser at the IP address of the DVX and you can do all the configuration right there. Now, to do that, of course, you need to know the IP address. So fortunately on the front panel, using the status menu, you can get to uh, the IP address. It shows it to you right here. So I'm gonna uh, exit out of this real quick and move over. And since I know my IP address is that, I can put that in here, 192.168. And because this is a, a fresh unit out of the box, we'll log in with our standard, standard username and password. This is in the, the quick start guide, so you don't have to remember it. And this brings you into the, the web interface. So we're gonna focus on the switcher configuration. So all these other uh, pieces here, the network security, these are all exactly the same as any NX uh, controller that you would get. So we're gonna focus on configuration. So we go into the switcher configuration tab. And the main area here is divided into two main sections. In the, the left-hand section over here, there's a at-a-glance status for the inputs and the outputs. The outputs are down here. Let me switch over to video so that we can see them all together. Um, I can get information about each of these. I can switch inputs to outputs over here. And when I select an input or an output, this right-hand pane will show me all the configuration uh, settings that are available to me um, for that port. Um, now I mentioned there's a lot of information here that you can see. We call these badges. Um, and they, they tell you a lot with all the different icons. So if you click the legend button here, we'll go to the legend and you can see that the top is color coded. Green means we got good video. White means we got no signal there. We can also see the, the name of that uh, input or output. Uh, the input or output number. In this uh, section here, you get the input output type, whether it's HDMI or DX uh, link, or if it's audio, we can see signal details here. Is it HDMI? Uh, is it not plugged in? We have encryption status here, and at the end we have audio status. So if we go back here, we can see, looking at these inputs and outputs, we can see we have a number of greens. Now, as you can probably tell, I'm doing this from my home, so I don't actually have all of the inputs and outputs uh, uh, connected, but I have enough for us to get to, to go through the configuration and get a sense of how things work. Um, but you can see I've got three inputs connected that are all green. One of them actually has uh, encrypted content on it. They all have embedded audio and I've got three displays here. So um, this is some good information. You notice that these just say input one, input two. This is not gonna be very helpful when we come back to this site. We don't wanna have to retrace cables or, or even have to dig out documentation sometimes to figure out where things are connected. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to name these things. So if we look back at our um, configuration here, you can see that our inputs are uh, this web conferencing PC on the first two inputs. And then we have a document camera, a media player, and a laptop. So if I select this input, I can say rack PC1 and rack PC2. And I can say, I think this was dot cam. Yep, dot cam media player laptop. So this is dot cam media player. laptop. And on the output sides, I've got uh, video recording, confidence monitor, front display, rear display. So I can do those here. This is video record. Confidence monitor. 
This is front display. And rear display. So this makes it nice. Actually, I can make sure that that shows up on the DX link output and not just the HDMI output there. So this makes it convenient when you come in here, you, when you click things, you can actually see what, uh, what things are connected. Um, now, one of the first things I like to do is check the, the DX link. So if I select a DX link output here, I can see all the configuration. We'll get to the configuration in a minute, but first let's, let's look at uh, some DX link details that we have here. Now, um, the DX link quality is important. I've actually got some prototype hardware here, so, so this doesn't uh, fill in correctly, but uh, I do have good signal here, and normally this would be red for bad, green for good. Um, you can see firmware version, but the other interesting thing in this page is you can see all I've done is uh, I've opened up the, the, the boxes for the DX link endpoints. I've plugged them into uh, the category cables to connect to the DX link ins and outs on the DVX and I've connected the sources and the, and the displays to them. And you can see I've already got an IP address. These are IP addresses on our ICS LAN private network. Uh, and they're already given a device ID. They're already connected into the controller. So they're all ready to go for programming. Um, this is uh, something that we've done on the DGX for a while. This is new for our DVX product line. Um, and that saves you from having to do uh, things with these dip switches. So it's a, it's a real convenient feature there. So, um, so let's, let's switch over to looking at uh, the kind of things that we can configure. And if we select, uh, let's say this rack PC input, we can see that I'm getting um, 3840 by 2160 at 60 Hertz. So I'm getting 4K60 on uh, coming in on this PC. And that's good because I've asked it for 4K60. I've set the EDID mode here for 4K60. I have a number of other choices that I can select. Uh, and I can even select a preferred uh, resolution. There's quite a long list of resolutions. And this is something as a designer, you just need to know what resolution you want in your system. What are your ultimate displays? Um, you can enable HDR if you support HDR in the system here. Uh, and on EDIS, you can even save and load EDIS. So you can put custom EDIS in here if you like. Uh, and then over on HDCP compliance, this is a checkbox that you can select to make the DVX look like it's not a compliant display. This is really useful for a lot of Apple devices that will encrypt content regardless if they see that they're connected to a compliant display. Since we're going to a video recording device, we don't really want our Mac laptops that somebody might bring in to deliver encrypted content. So we're gonna leave this unchecked for things like the laptop. Um, another thing we can do for the laptop is, you know, we may not want it delivering uh, 4K uh, if, uh, if I bring my laptop in and, and it delivers 4K th to the display and I open up a spreadsheet, that's going to be really, really small. Uh, so you can select here HD resolutions. You can say, I really would rather just have 1920 by 1080. So um, that's some of the customization that you can do here with the, with the inputs. On the, uh, on the outputs, we'll look at some of the, the scaling pieces that we have here. So uh, output one, I don't happen to have any 4K displays sitting around in my office, but uh, I have a, a monitor here that's 1680 by 1050. And this is the native resolution of this display because I'm auto scaling. So I've read the EDID from that display and I'm, I'm scaling it directly. If, if I wanted to, I could force it into a different resolution. Um, uh, I, I could force an out the output to go to a different resolution. And there's, there's a lot of choices that I have here. But one nice feature is if you check this box, this dropdown now only shows resolutions that we read from the edit of the display that the display says it can support. So this is kind of a nice way to, to, to not pick something that the display can't support. Um, you can also go into manual mode if you like. Um, for most applications, auto mode is really the best, uh, the best option. Uh, on the right-hand side over here, we've got some display settings. You can mute and freeze, and we have some test patterns that are basic, but let you at least see that you've got video going to the display. Um, but another nice feature is this blank color. Uh, the blank color is what will show when uh, that output is routed to an input that doesn't have any video coming in on it. So by default, it's blue. Uh, so if I have a laptop connected and routed to the display and I disconnect my laptop, um, that output will go blue, that display will, will turn blue. Um, 
another nice feature though is that you can you can also let that display go to sleep so if i allow it to sleep here and i set the sleep time to say 120 seconds then when somebody disconnects their laptop if that's what's routed to this display the display will go blue for two minutes and then we'll just drop video signal to the display at all and the display can go to sleep so um, this doesn't require any programming this just happens by configuring it like this if you think about all of the places where you have walked into a conference room in the morning and the display's been on all night long, just showing this blank screen with this halo around it. Um, you think about uh, all the energy that can be saved by checking this box and setting these, these displays to go to sleep when there's no video content going to them. Um, with this blank color, you can also select a logo. This is nice if you wanna show a company logo. So uh, when, uh, nobody's connected their laptop yet, and that's what's routed. You can just see the company logo. You can even pull that up programmatically. So you could have a break button on your touch panel. When you hit the break button, you show the company logo. Um, and, and that kind of gives it a nice touch. You can also put instructions in these logos. So you can create images that have instructions like, uh, please connect your laptop to the HDMI cable on the table or something like that. Um, and then you can bring that up. And, and show it to, you don't have to have special instruction cards, things like that. Um, you upload those logos here. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty straightforward interface. And there's a, a few other output um, settings that you have here, brightness and contrast. You can also set the on-screen display. This is nice during troubleshooting. You can see which input is routed to that output and you can see the resolution of that source device. Um, most of the time people leave this off for the end customer. Uh, so, that's, uh, that's the video side of things. Let's switch over to audio. And um, first we're gonna talk about audio inputs. Um, don't worry about this stuff down here yet. We'll get to that in a minute. So when I select uh, the HDMI input, the Rack PC, for example, I can see that I can set stereo mono. Uh, I can adjust the gain. Uh, you may have different inputs that have different um, levels of audio. This gives you an opportunity to standardize those levels of audio uh, by increasing or decreasing gain on each input on an input by input basis. Um, I can also adjust the EDID mode of just the audio portion, uh, just the audio portion of the EDID to ask for something besides two channel PCM audio. If I want multi-channel audio or double digital or, or DTS, I can select that from this drop down here. Um, so really a lot of uh, a lot of options that you have for um, customizing the sound in your space. Each input also has separate compression. Um, this just attenuates any loud signals just to keep you from, from blowing out your speakers. Um, there's some presets that you can choose, um, but from those presets, you can go make uh, whatever customizations that you want from there. When you're looking at inputs, you can also look at any of the microphone inputs. So you can see uh, Dante, uh, the Dante settings here at the top. I've got uh, eight channels of Dante audio. Now by default, they're paired up into stereo left, right channels that are switchable. And you can see that they're available over here for me to switch. Uh, if I were to select them here, I could route them to an output. Now I've got uh, I've got a microphone array driving it, so we probably need a few of these to be microphones. So if we set a couple to microphones, you notice that they're no longer available for me to switch, but they've now become available for me to mix into the program audio, and we'll see the mixing when we get to the output side. Uh, so we can see those are the uh, the Dante channels; they're enabled. I have six analog mic inputs. I'm not using them in this case, but we could. Each one of them has uh, individual phantom power that can be enabled. If it's a mic level input, you've got a preamp gain here that you can bring up probably somewhere in the, the 30, 40 uh, dB range. And, and for line inputs, there's also uh, a gain setting here again to normalize uh, between the different inputs. And each of these microphone inputs has a three band parametric equalizer. Um, I've got sort of some you know, funny stuff set up here, uh, just to show how you can adjust. Uh, there's also gating. This allows you to attenuate the microphone until it breaks above a certain level, uh, just to try to keep the noise down. 
There's a, a limiter, again, that limits the, the microphone, uh, the maximum microphone output, and then there's compression as well on each of the microphone inputs. And down here, I can see a level meter. I think I have one set up here. Um, so this is actually live. Uh, you can get just a very basic uh, level meter to show what's happening. So let's look at the uh, outputs for a minute. Let me, let me clear things here. Um, before we talk about the outputs though, um, I want to talk about audio groups. Um, so this is a little bit different, uh, but there are four audio groups. Um, the DVX 4K has four assignable uh, output audio groups that can be configured each with a different mix and a different EQ, if you like. So each physical audio output, the amplified output, the line level, the Dante outputs, the HDMI outputs, they can each be assigned individually to one of these groups. And whatever audio gets routed to that group gets routed to whatever the physical ports you've assigned into that group. So for our system, we're gonna use three groups. We need a group for the amplified audio output in the space. We need a group for the conferencing PC. We want to send separate audio to the conferencing PC. Uh, and then we need a group for the, the recording device. We may want to send a different mix, different EQ to the recording device. So by default, the amp is already in group one, so we can just leave it there. And we'll use output one as our room uh, audio. The web conferencing PC, by default, this, uh, this uh, output two, analog output two, is already uh, going to uh, the web conference, is, is already in group two. So I can just leave it there and that goes into the web conferencing PC. Now group three, if I look at group three, group three, I need the video recorder. I need different audio going on this HDMI output one. If I look for HDMI output one, it's down here in the input pass through. So I don't really want it passing through. I can go up here and I wanna assign it to group three. So now I have three separate outputs and I can mix and I can EQ those differently. Um, I've left this Dante output two in group two. I can use that for the, uh, the AEC reference for the microphone. I could have used Dante output one if I had wanted to. I just go in and select it and move it down to group two. Um, but we can use group two since it's already, or Dante output two since it's already there. So, this grouping is convenient for a couple of, uh, a couple of reasons. Um, one advantage, for example, would be a divisible room. So if I have a, a room that is used as all one big room, I could move all of the outputs that are driving speakers into one group and just deliver audio to that one group and I'll be delivering audio into the whole space. When I divide it up into two spaces, programmatically I could move the, uh, the, the ports that are driving speakers in one part of the room into a different group and uh, leave the, the outputs that are driving the other part of the room uh, in this group. And so now when I switch to that, uh, to that output, I'm only switching to the output for that room um, and I can use the other group for the other room. Um, and again, I wanna uh, point out that anytime you do a switch, if I select uh, input one, for example, and I wanna route it, down here, if I select, say, the amplifier, I'm actually selecting the whole group. So again, anything I route to the amp is actually gonna go to any output that's grouped uh, into that, that same group. So let's look at an output and we'll look at mix. Let's say we look at the amplified output. Now, one of the first things we notice is that uh, we can choose either the eight ohm or the 700 volt output. Um, now our system is showing that we're using 700 volt here. So we need to change that to amp 700 volt. We also have a nice test tone generator. This is great for troubleshooting. Uh, and then down here in this group, we can set uh, the volume for that group. We can also set audio min and max. This is nice. Uh, you don't have to do it inside your programming. If you just set it here, any attempt to drive the volume lower than the minimum will just be set to the minimum. And likewise, any attempt to set it greater than the, the maximum will just be uh, set to the maximum. 
if this were a stereo output and not 700 volt, we'd have balance. And then we also have sync delay here. So this is useful if you're doing different video processing that delays the video for more than a typical amount of time, you can delay the audio so that it, it synchronizes. Uh, when I was talking about the microphones and I made, uh, I made some of those Dante inputs microphones, I mentioned that they would be configurable for the mix now. And that's done over here. So for this amp output, um, I might not want any of the mics. I might want the mics uh, maybe just going to my audio conferencing system. And I just want to have just the, the input. Uh, if I switch over to the web conferencing PC, I may not want any of the input. And I, may, I may just want the microphones. And if I switch over to my voice recording, uh, maybe I want everything here. Um, and I can tweak these so that the mic level sound right for, for how I'm going to record it. Another interesting thing you can do with this, uh, with this Min Max is uh, for this video recorder, you may not want to be able to change volume. And uh, you know, if, if you don't uh, uh, take the step to configure it in your program, you can just set the minimum and maximum to the same value and then you will always get that value uh, and it won't be changeable. So. It's, it's, a, it's a little trick. Um, again, we got balance and sync delay here. And then each output, each of the group outputs, each of the four outputs have its, has its own 10-band parametric EQ. This works uh, just like the, uh, the microphones, only we've got 10 bands here instead of three. Uh, so I can uh, set different filter types. Uh, I got band pass and band stop. High pass, low pass, treble shelf, bass shelf. So it's a very, very full featured parametric EQ that you can use. Um, also, you can choose advanced feedback suppression. This is the, the DBX feedback suppression that um, detects it uh, even quicker than the human can hear it and, and has some very, very narrow band filters that it uses to prevent the feedback. Um, over here on the right, you see tone adjust. So in a room, for example, you might want to EQ for the specific uh, tonal qualities of the room. Uh, but then you might also have different applications that the room is used for. So uh, we've got some presets over here. If you're using it for just voice in a, in a conference call, you can choose voice. And it just um, adjusts the tone a little bit to be a little bit more optimal for voice. Or you've got music or movie. Or you don't have to use these if you don't like. And you can just leave them off. Now, each output group also has its own set for ducking. So if you've got a primary speaker at the front of the room speaking into the microphone, when they speak, you can turn on ducking so that uh, the, the other audio that's going into the space gets dropped down a little bit so that the speaker doesn't have to try to shout into the microphone uh, to get over the, uh, the program audio. So, that covers the, um, all of the audio outputs. And we've now configured uh, the video inputs and outputs, the audio inputs and outputs. I um, showed you a few of the tricks. There's just uh, a couple of other things that we can touch on. Uh, if we go into switcher status here, you can see we have a couple of alarms along the top. These are actually available to you in code as well. So if one of these alarms goes off, it, it can trigger something in your code. Um, so there's a fan alarm, a power alarm, and a temperature alarm. And this allows you to see here fan speed and temperature inside the box, inside the DBX. Now I talked about the front panel and uh, how you can use the front panel controls to uh, see status and configure things. If this uh, DVX is installed in a location where it's accessible to the user, it's maybe out uh, or it's in a lectern that's not locked or something like that, you can disable the front panel buttons. Uh, when you lock out the front panel, there's actually two options you have. You can do a full lockout, which will prevent any button from doing anything except bringing up a display that says the front panel is locked out. Um, but more useful may be a menu-only lockout. This allows you to still adjust volume. Uh, you can mute video and audio. Uh, most impo importantly, it lets you still get into the status information so that you can see some status about the box. But it prevents you from making any configuration adjustments. You, you can't change gains or groups or any of that sort of thing. Um, you can adjust the intensity of the LCD on the front panel. Uh, and just for convenience, there's a couple little check boxes over here to mute video and audio. 
Now we've got this fully configured um, for this particular space. And let's say we had five or six of these spaces that we wanted to do, we could go through all of this configuration again. We could put all that configuration into a, a boot section of our program if we wanted to. But uh, another option you have is to save this configuration. If you hit the save button here, you get a basic dialog to save it someplace. Um, and then I could move to a different DBX, come back to this page and I could load. This lets me pull up uh, the, the configuration file that I just saved and all of that configuration that we just went through will be replicated into uh, this new box. Or let's say we're decommissioning a box, we're, we're moving it to a different purpose or, or you think you've messed up the configuration so badly you don't, don't know what, uh, what might be wrong, you can also just restore to default. Uh, so if you, you go in here, you'll get a couple of warnings before it implements and, and you can restore the box back to defaults. So we have uh, got this DVX configured uh, pretty much how we'd like it. Um, so uh, we've talked about uh, some of the features that the DVX uh, uh, has to, to make it easy to configure with the web interface. Um, but there's also some features in there that make it easy to troubleshoot. So you've, uh, we mentioned the front panel control where you can get status, you can do some configuration. Uh, we've got the web interface that it's a, it's an HTML5 web interface, so it's it's responsive. So you could bring in a tablet. It even works on a phone. Uh, if you if you bring it in on your phone and you just want to see status, this this uh, switcher tab here may be the easiest to look at in a in a small uh, display. You can see status about the various inputs and outputs, and you can do some basic switching here uh, just to see what's going on. Um, you can see we've got the inputs and outputs named. That's going to be convenient when we come back to this uh, to, to this space. And that uh, that completes the configuration for this setup. So hopefully this uh, exercise has highlighted for you a few of the features the DVX uh, has, uh, maybe some that you haven't been aware of before, uh, and that you can use in your next project. If you have any questions, um, I think we've got a little bit of time left, uh, so I'd be happy to take questions. We do have a few questions that came in. Um, Great. The first one is asking, how does closed captioning work with this product? Uh, there isn't anything uh, specific in the product that will implement closed captioning. Uh, you can turn on closed captioning in the source device and closed captioning will be fed through uh, the uh, uh, the HDMI video signal, uh, but there's nothing, uh, we don't have any way to, to perform a closed captioning of a, of a system, but we also don't block any of the signals that implement the closed captioning if it's done uh, externally. Okay, next question. Um, when will the DVX 4K60 be updated to be supported by RPM? That is already in the works. Uh, we've got a, a test candidate in uh, the, our testing facility now, uh, and I don't have the latest status on it, but uh, we should be um, within weeks or at most months away from having a, a, an RPM update that includes DBX. So it should be coming very soon. Okay, next question is asking if you would talk about the network tab. Uh, I can talk briefly about the network tab, I suppose. Um, there's some basic networking setups in here. This really doesn't have anything to do with the switcher. This would be the same networking information that you would get in a um, Netlinks uh, central controller, a 1200, 2200, 3200. It just allows you to change uh, addressing modes from DHCP uh, to, to setting a specific uh, IP address. You can set domain names and DNS. Um, you can you can set date and time uh, so that you can choose time servers, for example. Uh, and if you're choosing a time server, you can set daylight savings time uh, settings, uh, you know, when it starts and when it stops. So um, not a lot to talk about in, in here, just some basic um, network uh, setup pieces. Okay, then we have a whole batch of questions coming in from Switzerland. Um, the first one is asking where and how will the Dante IP addresses be set with the Dante controller software? 
I uh, I don't know. I'll have to I'll have to take that uh, offline and and provide uh, an answer there. Uh, I'm not an expert in how the Dante setup works, um, so I'll have to get back to you. Okay. Uh a few of these are related to Dante, so I'll, I'll read them off and um, whatever we can answer. If you want to reach out to Jeff directly, um, he'll be happy to follow up. But the next question question is, how can you use the secondary Dante interface method one as backup, uh, method two as what? Uh, yeah, we can take that offline as well. Okay. Third question, does the DVX generate a Dante clock? DVX is shown as master notebook as um, secondary. I, uh, again, we can take that offline. Okay. I think we can, we can probably just bundle up all the Dante questions and put those in and, and I'll get to our Dante experts that okay. uh, will put together some answers. I think there's some of that information in the manual, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to get the answers that we need there. Okay, I think that was it for the Dante questions. Um, the next one is asking, how exactly does the Mike ducking function priority work? Um, there you can currently select inactivated microphones or microphones from another zone. Yeah, so it's, there's one priority microphone that you can select if you want to. Um, so uh, in this, Let's see here. <laughs> the, uh, the general idea is that you can select a, um, a single microphone to be your priority microphone, if you like. Um, and that microphone would then be the primary microphone that the speaker would have. And it would duck not only the program audio, but it would duck all of the other microphones, any of the other microphones, uh, whether they're enabled at the time or become enabled later. Um, and uh, how much uh, that priority mic uh, gets mixed in is uh, set separately um, based on all of the other mics. Um, if you don't set a priority, then uh, you don't duck the other mics. All the mics have, have equal priority and any microphone just ducks the program audio and not any of the other microphones. Okay, next question. Is it possible to use the DVX without a touch panel with web control or virtual keypad? Absolutely. Yes, it's a, it's a full Netlink central controller. Uh, you can bring the, the TPC control piece in, if you like, with uh, the, the iPhone or the, I, uh, the, the phone or the tablet or the, the BYOD solution. Uh, and yes, you can use it with a, uh, a MCP control pad as well. Um, and even a, uh, a, a Metro keypad. Okay, the next question is asking if you can give more of an explanation and examples for the third party HD based T devices five play completely possible. Uh, for the third party integration on D the, our DX link inputs and outputs, we support audio, video, and Ethernet. Um, so uh, serial and IR is not going to work because the serial and IR is done over our own Netlinks protocol uh, to our own devices. Uh, but you can, uh, if you can control it over network, over Ethernet, the Ethernet uh, connection is made there. So you could control it uh, from code over Ethernet. So you get audio, video, and Ethernet. Okay, next question is asking, what can be saved and restored if you export the switcher settings, logos, custom eated? Uh, I believe, I, I'm not sure that logos get saved. Um, the EDIDs, uh, I, I'm not sure if the custom EDIDs get saved. I believe it's primarily all of the configurations, um, but that's a good question. I'll have to check on that and see if the logos and the custom EDIDs get saved off within that file as well. I don't believe they do. Okay, and then the last question from this group, is there a virtual DVX which can be installed locally on a laptop as was available with the old DVX? Uh, no, uh, there is not a, that, that was, um, that was a different technology that we used for, for that, that allowed you to kind of demonstrate that web interface. Um, 
we can make uh, uh, DVXs available um, on the corporate network uh, for uh, for inside uh, Harman access, or uh, if we need to, I'm sure we could put one on an externally facing network that people could uh, could connect to. But uh, there's not a way that you could do this virtually on a PC. Okay, so Andrea, for the handful of questions that you had that Jeff was going to follow up with you directly, if you just want to go ahead and email him at jeff.birch at harman.com, he'll help you out with that. We do have Perfect. some other questions that have come in. Um, in the signal path diagram, how is the camera being routed? Uh, that's interesting. I didn't highlight that uh, as I should. So the camera's in the back of the room. So it's a USB 2.0 camera. It's being routed into the USB 2.0 connection on the, the RX, the, the 4K60 DXLink receiver. That's going over the HDBase-D connection, the DXLink connection, the category cable back to the uh, DXLink output on the DVX, where the USB 2.0 connector here is getting all of that USB 2.0 information from the camera, and that's being routed into the USB port of the conferencing PC. So it just is a, a extension cable, basically. It lets us get the uh, the camera video over a distance uh, to the rack. All right. The next question is asking: Can you use the older DX TX and DX RX? Uh, we are working on a very complete um, compatibility matrix. In general, audio, video, and Ethernet uh, work um, across almost all of the uh, DXLink transmitters and receivers in the product portfolio. The auto config, uh, that, that auto configuration where they get the IP address automatically and get the device ID, those only work with the, the newer DVX, uh, I'm sorry, the newer um, uh, 4K60 DXLink transmitters and receivers. But most of the other devices, you'll get audio, video, and network. Uh, or if it's a DX Lite, for example, you'll get audio and video. Okay, next question is asking, in contrast with the older DVXs, is the new one able to auto set up DXLink TXRX boxes in terms of IP addresses, device ID like a GGX does? Yes, as long as you are using the, um, as long as you are using the newer DXLink uh, 4K60 transmitters and receivers. So you can see here this device, I didn't have to do any setup it got an IP address and it got a device ID and it's connected to the to the central controller and ready for me to program. Okay, and then a follow-up question to that. Do the DX link boxes get the IP from the new DVX ICS LAN network? Yes, yes. Yep, you can see here, these are ICS LAN IP network addresses here, the 198.18. Um, so these are ICS LAN private network connections. Okay, another question. How about USB? What devices are supported? HID, audio, video. Can you share an example use case? Uh, yeah, so you can do HID uh, devices. Uh, those are still supported. They're point to point from the receiver to the transmitter. Um, so this use case here, we use the USB 2.0 camera to get video. Uh, if this were a, a sound bar with audio as well, then you could get audio and video uh, from this uh, remote location, like the back of the room, and you could bring that uh, over the category cable or covering that long distance into the rack where the DVX is, and then you could deliver that USB signal anywhere inside the rack. Um, it also works on the transmitter, so if your, if your camera was um, uh, located at the table where your laptop was, for example, you could plug in uh, a USB camera over here and have it also traverse through the DX link and then come out this USB port into wherever you wanted to route your USB signals. Okay, next question is asking, do we have any association with other display brands which can accept AMX DX link HD base T signal directly without receiver? Uh, the outputs are the standard HD base T chipset. So audio, video and network will connect to any uh, standard HD base T uh, display or projector of any brand, as long as it's a standard HD base T implementation. Next question is asking if the USB in TX and RX will work for the touch display. 
uh, I'm not sure which touch display. Uh, if, if the touch display acts like a hid device, then yes. Uh, if it's a custom touch overlay that requires some special driver, uh, that would be dependent on the driver that you end, uh, the, 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 the end device that you end up connecting to it. Uh, so the PC, for example, would need whatever driver you would, you would need for, for that touch interface. Okay, it looks like that was the last question to come in. Um, but as mentioned, if anybody has an additional question and wants to reach out to Jeff directly, um, please feel free to do that. His email is jeff.birch at harman.com or you can reach out to me and I can route that question to him. So thank you so much, Jeff. Um, as mentioned, this uh, webinar was recorded. There is a second session of this being offered later tonight if you'd like to attend again. And we will have the recording posted out on our channel in about three days. Um, if you're interested in future sessions, you can go out to pro.harman.com and see our upcoming calendar of sessions. As mentioned, there's about 20 scheduled throughout August and September, and we're even starting to book things um, through December. So to keep an eye on that. Uh, thank you all for attending, and Jeff, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Laura.